morning, glory and evening, grace, America. It's Hugh Hewitt. I am opening this hour because the budget deal is front and center in the uh, Congress of the United States. And Senator Tom Cotton from the state of Arkansas, which used to have a football team and a university, is my guest. Senator Cotton, welcome. It's always good to talk to you. Did the uh, did the Razorbacks get out of their beds this weekend? Did they play? Yeah, Hugh, not only do we have a football team, we got to see them uh, in overtime times four over the weekend. Four overtimes beat Auburn. You beat Auburn? Are they actually are they Division One this year? Uh, I, th- I think there actually may have been a rival of Ohio State for the national championship before we beat them. Well, that 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 was not the case because <laughs> the Ohio State University is unbeaten. Senator Cotton, let's get to the important stuff because I assume you've been diving into this bill. And would you explain to people what is happening, what it does to the Pentagon, and your assessment of whether or not you'll vote for it? Well, Hugh, I haven't uh, yet decided how I'm going to vote on this legislation. I have to say that the more I study this budget deal, the more concerns I have about it. It accomplishes a few things. First, we're going to reach the debt ceiling next week. This would extend the debt ceiling until early 2017. Second, the government needs to be funded by December 11th. Uh, this would set the top-line budget numbers for not only this fiscal year but the next fiscal year, and then we'd pass individual spending bills reflecting the priorities of the American people. Within that, those spending categories, it would increase defense spending somewhat. Unfortunately, it would also increase domestic spending. And then it has some other provisions related to Medicare and Social Security disability and crop insurance and, and so forth. Um, the defense spending is certainly needed. We've talked many times on your show about how we need to substantially increase our defense spending, but it does have to be measured against the baseline. Uh, and the more I look at it, the more I think that we didn't actually get that much new defense spending of against the background law, the Budget Control Act, which was going to increase defense spending uh, to begin with. And then that has to be weighed against some of the drawbacks of the bill. For example, the increase in domestic spending, which was already increased substantially in 2009 thanks to the stimulus and the lack of real significant reforms in the disability program designed to get people back to work to protect the most vulnerable and also to protect taxpayer dollars and then of course there's the usual budget gimmicks like selling oil out of strategic petroleum reserve or or pushing spending cuts out 10 years in the future when we haven't been able to obey them for the last two years so i'm I'm looking at it you uh carefully uh we obviously need to uh fund our military at substantially higher levels than we have but i have to say that i've got real reservations about what i've seen so far now let me give you my reaction we have a kamikaze president and if we go into shutdown mode i don't think he cares about the military and we could end up with less money i i I, it just as a vindictive thing for the pentagon well hugh uh, the, the president has requested more de- more defense spending, but he also requested more domestic spending. And he even vetoed the Defense Authorization Act last week because right. he was using the troops as leverage. In the middle of a shooting war, when we had the first KIA in Iraq uh, just a day earlier, he was using the troops as leverage to get more spending for things like the IRS and the EPA and other of his bureaucratic agencies. Um, that said, again, the background law, the status quo law, actually did increase defense spending somewhat this year. So I I think we have to weigh the actual increase that we could have gotten if we had come to loggerheads with the president in the spending uh, negotiations in December versus a lot of the negative parts of the bill. Again, I'm still undecided on it. Um, If if we fail, I'd like to go back to the drawing board, pass a short-term debt ceiling extension, and then try to get something better for defense. Um, but we'll have to evaluate it uh, on, again, it's a, over 100 pages long. We just got it late last night. Okay, high-risk stuff. Let me go to Hillary Clinton Wednesday talking about veterans. Uh, I want to play the long version, to be fair, to the former Secretary of State. This is the Secretary of State talking with Rachel Maddow on Friday. One policy question that I think um, the Republicans are raising, they're talking about amongst themselves, hasn't really burst into a general election conversation yet, but I am genuinely shocked by it. Um, which is that it's becoming sort of fashionable in Republican circles to talk about abolishing the VA, uh, privatizing the VA, getting rid of it, uh, throwing veterans onto the mercies of the for-profit health care system. The reason they are able to propose something that radical is because the problems at the VA seem so intractable. Mm -hmm. If I had been running a Republican campaign against President Obama last year, I would have run it entirely on the VA. Mm -hmm. A bureaucracy, a bloated big government program that can't be fixed and let's do right by our veterans. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. do you, do you have any new ideas for trying to fix it? I mean, every, there, you can't find a person in politics who doesn't say we shouldn't do right by our veterans. Mm-hmm. But for some reason, this can't get fixed fast enough. 
Yeah, and I don't understand that. Uh, you know, I don't understand why we have such a problem because there have been a number of surveys of veterans, and overall, veterans who do get treated are satisfied with their treatment. Much now, more so than people much, in the regular system. Uh, it's yeah. exactly right. right. Now, nobody would believe that from the coverage that uh, you see uh, and the constant uh, berating of the VA that comes from the Republicans, in, in part in pursuit of this ideological agenda that But in have. part because there has been real scandal. There has been, and but it's not been as widespread as it has been made out to be. Now, I do think that some of the reforms that were adopted last year should be given a chance to work. Uh, if there is a waiting period uh, that is just uh, unacceptable, you should be able to, in a sense, get uh, the opportunity to go out, have a private physician take care of you, but at the cost of the VA. But I think it goes deeper than that, because if you look at not only VA health care, but the backlog on disability determinations, uh, there's something not working within the bureaucracy. And I have said I would like to literally appoint a SWAT team. I mean, bring in people and just tackle the disability, have an ongoing review of the care that is being given, do more to make sure that every VA hospital is delivering care to the highest standard of the community, because unfortunately, some are doing a lot better job than others are. And I think that the current new leadership that President Obama did put in uh, seems to be trying to tackle a lot of this. I just don't know if they have enough help. And here's a perfect example of the way that the Republicans uh, try to have it both ways. They try to create a downward spiral. Don't fund it to the extent that it needs to be funded because we want it to fail so then we can argue for privatization. They still want to privatize Medicare. They still want to do away with Social Security. And these are fights we've been having for 70, 80 years now. So we cannot grow weary in the face of these ideological assaults on basic fundamental services, whether it's the VA, Medicare, Social Security. So, uh, uh, but so we Senator have to be Tom Cotton, I'd like to ask you when you became an enemy of the VA and why you're <laughs> overstating the problem. Hugh, Hugh the, the, the most fundamental mistake that's unforgivable Hillary Clinton made, as she said literally when she meant figuratively, uh, <laughs> I guess the people in the VA are going to be very nervous about the literal SWAT teams coming in to get them. But uh, Hillary, Hillary Clinton is acting, you know, or she's treating Barack Obama like the chance to guard their presidency. I mean, who does she think has been president for the last seven years? Under whose watches the VA failed time and time again? Not everywhere. She's right about that. We have two VA hospitals in Arkansas. By and large, they provide a very good uh, quality of care, and veterans in Arkansas report to me that they're very satisfied with it. But there were serious, grave negligence in places like Arizona and, uh, and Pittsburgh that has to be addressed. And part of the problem is the, the VA, like a lot of government institutions, was designed for conditions in society, and it performed a role very well, caring for its predecessors, cared for Civil War veterans and World War I veterans at a time when healthcare, the health care sector in the society was very limited. Well, now we've got great clinics and hospitals in almost every community. It, it's really time that we reform the VA, that we let veterans get basic care in their own communities, that we refocus the VA's uh, efforts on some of the characteristic injuries and illnesses that our veterans have, like in my generation, traumatic brain injury or severe amputations that even the best local and regional hospitals aren't really equipped to do. That's what Republicans want to do in the same way that we are trying to save Social Security and save Medicare. Hillary Clinton is the only one who wants to eliminate them because anyone who wants to anyone who's for the status quo in those programs is for their elimination because they are ultimately going to go bankrupt if we don't reform them and save them. Not for my generation, Hugh, but for the old timers, people like you. <laughs> Let me play for you. Let, let me play for you the best line of what she had to say. I'm glad that you've got two VAs that are working in Arkansas. I, I cannot report the same about the Long Beach in my backyard because of my own friend's personal experience with it. But here's what she said about the scandal, the short version. It's not been as widespread as it has been made out to be. Now, Tom Cotton, I read the Auditor General report. Uh, the FBI investigated this on a criminal basis, 120,000 veterans. Yeah, it, it's pretty widespread, Hugh, and it would appear that there were best practices that were violating the rules, best practice to violate the rules 
that VA headquarters were spreading around um, through backdoor channels and off the books conversations, maybe even moving staffers around to help them game the system to avoid being caught by their internal audit controls of wait times that were excessive or appointments that couldn't get made and so forth. And that, that's why the VA has to be reformed. We have to refocus its efforts on the injuries and illnesses that are most characteristic of each generation of warriors, make sure that people who are need health care, to whom we promise health care, have a choice to get it in their local communities, and that managers at every level of the VA have greater flexibility, the same kind of flexibility that hospital and clinic managers have in the private sector, to weed out some of these bad apples. I, I hope that every Republican candidate talks to Tom Cotton about this, a veteran who knows this issue up and down. Senator, thank you, and we'll talk to you. 